Tyndale Philosophy is delighted to welcome Professor Steve Fuller, who, as you'll see from the biography in your packs, is the Auguste Comte Chair in Social Epistemology in the Department of Sociology at the University of Warwick. He's a very distinguished author, 17 uh, different books. You can 18. see 18. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Since we wrote hey, the biography, hey, that, that's right? how productive the man is. I mean, <laughs> let's see if at the end of the talk it's still at 18. Who knows? So, that's right, you know. I got the keyboard out. <laughs> 18 different books, uh, one of which you can browse outside that, there, and the others are, uh, we can give you uh, the publication details to order them and so on. Uh, he's been very closely associated with the social epistemology program. But there's one other thing I'd like to draw your attention to from the biography, in addition to all uh, Professor Fuller's academic achievements, is that he was an expert witness in a, a very important legal case in the United States of America between Kitz Miller and the Dover Area School District on this uh, area of design in nature. So we're looking forward very much to uh, what you've got to say, Professor Fuller, and I invite you now to speak on why some people like the idea of design in nature and others don't. First of all, thanks so much for the introduction because it, this is exactly how I want to begin the talk, uh, is about my uh, participation in the court case because um, many of you may not know who I am or why inv I'm involved in this, um, but um, in a way giving you a sense of how I got involved in the court case gives you a sense of where I'm coming from on these issues. And um, unless I'm mistaken, I take this to be a fairly friendly crowd to the design theory, uh, the, uh, the idea that the uh, universe is designed and all the rest of it. Um, and so I'm addressing you, you might say, in that vein. Okay? Um, and so a lot of the things that I may be raising may seem kind of problematic and critical and so forth, but I'm, I'm basically addressing these from the standpoint of someone who is supportive of the hypothesis, but in a sense it has a lot of implications that often have made people recoil from wanting to follow it through, uh, especially in scientific detail. Okay, because it's one thing to believe that the universe is designed, it's the other thing to turn it into a scientific research program. And I do think that um, there's a sense in which that kind of tension, I think, very much exists, especially for people who are kind of theologically minded. And I take the, the, given the venue of the conference and so forth, this is an appropriate thing to bring up here. Okay, so I start off as someone who is actually supportive of, uh, of the design approach. And in fact, let me just say that I think, uh, you know, Steve Meyer's book, Signature in a Cell, is an excellent book to get people who are design-minded, interested in molecular biology as a field of research to study. Because it really does lay out a very clear, convincing case, and we saw, element, and we saw, you know, we saw sort of a summary version of that this morning. Um, and, I don't want, and, and I think that is a very important thing, because in a sense, what we really do need are people entering into uh, the natural sciences with a design mentality who are prepared to en entertain the relevant hypotheses of the kind that Steve was talking about this morning. So I think that's a very important thing. Uh, uh, and, and in fact, I think that's a very important thing uh, regardless of what kind of school you go to, whether it is a state-supported school or a private school. Uh, because I think it's, you know, as you know at the moment, there's just a general decline in science enrollments. And the ways and the, and the sort of motivations that people have for going into science these days aren't necessarily the ones that drove Newton and Einstein. Okay? Um, and, and so it seems to me that if you are, you know, if you want to provide a kind of motivational ground for getting people into science to think about their, you know, trying to understand the systematic unity of nature, the rational intelligibility of reality and all that kind of stuff, then actually providing a kind of, you know, providing the design hypothesis and more than that, I would say, uh, actually providing a theological backdrop that informed the scientists who have pursued the design hypothesis is very important for the promotion of science. Okay? In fact, I'm one of the people, I think maybe rather distinctive in the ID movement, who believes that actually theology is one of the ways to motivate the doing of science in the way in which people have regarded science as the signature contribution of, the, of Homo sapiens. Okay? Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about that, and, and, and that has not always been a, a popular hypothesis for lots of reasons. But let me say something about how I got into this, uh, in, into this issue. Um, I, was in, I was asked by uh, the lawyers for the defense, so there was this trial in, uh, in a school district in central Pennsylvania, um, which basically uh, was requiring its science teachers to read out a statement, that is to say just to read out a statement, uh, that there are alternatives to Darwin's theory of evolution with regard to the origins of life, and one of them is intelligent design, and there are books in the school library that you can consult if you want to 
you know, pursue this. That was what the teachers were required to say. This is what brought the lawsuit. Nobody was being forced to teach intelligence. I mean, I just wanted just to show in a way kind of the, the way in which this is such a, a kind of red button issue, a really hot topic, right? Is that it was this minimal thing that led to the, law, the, the, the lawsuit, okay? Um, and, and I think that's worth bearing in mind. Now, I was brought in as an expert witness uh, on the issue of whether uh, intelligent design has ever contributed uh, to science, basically. Because my PhD is in history and philosophy of science from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I did an MPhil here at Cambridge under Mary Hesse uh, in the early 1980s. Um, and, um, and the answer from that standpoint is categorically, yes, of course it's relevant. In fact, it may be, in fact, the most relevant strand of thought to the development of modern science. Okay, I think that's, that's something, you know, I said there and I'll say now, and I think to anyone who actually has any knowledge of the history and philosophy of science, this has got to be admitted. I think the question is whether this has any standing in terms of talking about what people ought to be taught today. But in terms of the back history of it, it's undoubtedly true across all the sciences. Okay. There is no question about that. And the question is whether in some sense we've superseded that and we've got some other way to motivate science or some other way to explain the various processes uh, that we're trying to understand when we do scientific research. And as Steve was saying this morning, well, no, the intelligent design hypothesis still is going strong and it, and it still can explain a lot of things uh, that, that uh, scientists still want to explain. Okay, fine. Um, now, I should also say in terms of where I stand with regard to the relationship between theology and science and so forth. Um, I would say, put it this way, um, I would say my interest in the existence of God and my interest in, especially in issues of divine agency and what that might amount to, has only been increased by my participation in the intelligent design movement in a way it would not have been otherwise. In other words, I might be counted as one of these people who in a sense doesn't have a kind of natural faith base, even though I was trained by the Jesuits, or maybe because I was trained by the Jesuits, um, before I went to university. But I do think I'm one of these people who is actually persuaded by rational theology arguments. And so for me, there is a sense in which looking at the evidence, looking at the arguments, I mean, the kind of thing that Steve Meyer was presenting actually does lead me to think, yes, there's some deep intelligence out there, right, that you can see in the genetic code, that you can see everywhere, and which was not available to Darwin or any of those 19th century guys who still, in a way, set the benchmark for the argument today. Okay? And so I'm one of these people who kind of, in a way, um, in a sense that the science does matter to me in terms of reinforcing a kind of theological perspective. But again, I do, I, I say this uh, in the spirit that this is a kind of a controversial view to hold. Um, and it's certainly not a view that sits comfortably either with professional scientists or religious believers. Because there is a sense in which, if you take the kind of view I hold, um, that there is a sense in which you're thinking about um, intelligent design, and especially if you're thinking about God as being the intelligent designer, as written in a very large scale, a scientific hypothesis. In a sense, you're, you're, you're not treating it as an unconditional commitment, for example, but you are treating it as a very, you know, as a scientific hypothesis with maybe a large degree of probability attached to it, but potentially reversible in light of evidence. Okay, and this has always been the tricky thing about what, you know, the status of natural theology and rational theology, um, especially within the Christian context where most of this stuff has been argued. Okay, and so I can understand in a way why, you know, Steve Meyer wants to in a way define intelligent design in a way that kind of avoids this kind of question. Um, but I do think it does force itself upon you in various ways. So let me give you an example. And it's an example that was suggested to me by what some of the things Steve said. Um, so we're talking about uh, in the 19th century, at the time that Darwin is, uh, is, is, is becoming intellect, you know, his intellectual formation is taking place, we're thinking about what counts as relevant uh, explanations. And, and we've got basically, we've got this one explanation that Charles Lyell uh, is promoting with regard to uh, geology, and it's a, uh, already by the time Darwin is um, writing, is a, is, a, is a fairly important uh, explanatory principle, and that is uniformitarianism. And that is to say that the only causes that you postulate um, that happened in the past are the ones that you can still see in operation today. 
uniformitarianism. And so the example, you know, so you think about how things happen in nature now, uh, and you say they were happening pretty much like that in the past, and then you have to sort of extrapolate, well, then what would it have been like if these things got extended back, let's say, several hundred thousand or millions of years, what would the Earth have looked like? And then you get a sense of what the climate would have been like and what kind of organisms would have been possible, and you can make some inferences backward that way. Okay. Um, now, uniformitarianism, in a way, is not, it's not an argument from analogy, right? It's, an argu it's, a, it's a much tighter connection that's being made, right? Namely, that it is really the same forces that are in, in, in effect in the past are in effect now. Now, the question is, doesn't an, an argument from agency conform to that kind of model? Right, so just as we see that there's, you know, that whenever we see intelligent things produced in the world, right, whenever we see things that are of a certain level of complexity or specification, right, that therefore there must be a, an intelligence, an agent behind it. Right, that's the way we observe it in the world today. So therefore, if, if life has exactly the same properties as, an, as a very complex artifact does, let's say, then we have to imagine there was an intelligent agent behind it. Now, is that an example of the same inference? This is the question. It only is if you think that there's a very essential connection between the two kinds of agency. Right? Which is to say, in effect, that the intelligent agent has to be very much like the kind of intelligence that we're very much familiar with. So there has to be a very tight connection between human intelligence and that other intelligence. Now, from a theological standpoint, you can justify this if you really take in a very l serious and literal way, which is how the scientific revolution got off the ground in the 17th century, that we are created in the image and likeness of God. So there is, a, there is a literal sense in which our minds and God's minds, not completely, but to a significant extent, are kind of of the same kind. And that then makes this kind of inference that Steve is pointing to make sense. It then becomes like the way in which the inference is normally used. That is to say, the type of intelligent agency that is operating in nature is very much like our intelligent agency. It may be much bigger, much more powerful, can do more complex things, but it is a difference of degree, not of kind. That's a very important point. Because if you look at the opposite view to uniformitarianism in the, in the 19th century, the view that was opposite to, Le, to, to Lyle, that was usually where all the religious people were. Okay? And that's catastrophism, right? And that's the idea. Yes, there's God, and he operates in a very mysterious way. Miracles, boom, flood, boom, this, boom, that, right? And so there are all these punctuated moments, right? So in a sense, uniformitarianism does not explain everything because there have been these very radical breaks, and they're radical breaks that could only be made by a power you know, that is much greater than anything we could conceive of because of the scale in which the breaks have taken place. Right, so catastrophism, in a sense, began as a kind of scientific project when you look at the different layers of rock where the animals you know, are buried and they're, and, they, and they're really quite strongly different and they seem to be very marked by periods and it's very hard to explain those gaps. And so you say, well, it's God just you know, zapping them. In, you know, and there may be more than one flood. Okay. Um, now that's a completely different... So this doesn't deny intelligent agency to God. Not at all. God may have had his reasons. But the way God is operating is so radically different from the way we're operating that from our standpoint, it's a miracle. Right? And you just have to postulate there were these breaks. And I think it's very important that that was how the dynamic went in the 19th century as far as this kind of debate took place. That most of the people who wanted to believe in a God that was not reducible to natural forces tended to go on the catastrophe side. Now, this is not to say that we're not religious people on the uniformitarian side. Of course they were. But they were people who, in a sense, were committed to the view that divine agency has to be cashed out materially. Right? So you have to end up coming up with what is the way in which the world gets infused with intelligence. You have to come up with a process that makes physical sense. Right? And this is where a lot of the toing and froing about thermodynamics comes from and things like that. Right? If you think about the kinds of issues that intelligent design has had to face as a scientific hypothesis, if they're promoting something that comes in some sense from the outside, but nevertheless makes sense of nature as it is, right? then you have to say, well, okay, how does this square with what we understand? And then the question becomes, if it does square with what we understand, why then do we need God? Why can't the divine agency simply be reduced to a certain set of physical laws or physical forces or certain laws of how life 
combined. So supposing we came up with an algorithm, a very sophisticated algorithm, that in a way could manufacture DNA. You know, we say, well, that's what God did. They say, okay, well, why do we need God? Okay. Um, now, I'm saying all this because I do think this is something worth bearing in mind, that the history of this kind of argument didn't go in theism's direction. And the tendency had been for theists to, in a way, keep a notion of God that, in a way, r keeps a space open for mi miracles in nature that, that, in a way, cannot be scientifically investigated or understood. That's one point. Um, but there's another way around this, and this was the way in which uh, you can sort of see how people responded to Darwin in the 19th century. Um, and what it does is it takes the issue of design away from the level at which I think we're sort of used to talking about in the intelligent design movement, which is in terms of the design of the particular genome, the design of a particular organism, and think about design at the macro level, at the global level. Okay, because um, one of the people who was associated with the, you know, this inference to the best explanation that Steve Meyer was talking about, who was in a way a, both a teacher and then later a critic of Darwin, was William Hewell, um, the master of Trinity College, who was a very important person in the history of, of natural theology and the history of science. He was a geologist. He was one of the founders of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. Okay, and he's the man who coined the word scientist to name a profession, right, who had to be trained in a certain way. And this was part of he was also a, uni a very important university administrator, and he was very worried about the fact that all the science training was happening outside the universities, and that in some sense, you had to incorporate scientific knowledge as part of liberal arts, that in a sense, you would have to go to the, u you know, so it become fully accredited, legitimized knowledge. Okay. Now, Hugh believed that the one thing that, let's say, Darwin could not explain, or any of these people who would, as it were, reduce divine agency into just a set of natural forces, what they couldn't explain was the unity of nature, the, the design at the highest level. Okay, because so far, you know, when we talk about intelligent design, we're like opening up animals, we're looking at what goes on in the genome, but then there's this kind of larger level of design in nature as such. Okay, because um, it's one thing to say, yes, we, we have particular laws that explain phenomena in the various disciplines, uh, you know, in, in the various domains of reality. So we have physical laws, biological laws, chemical laws, whatever other kinds of laws, psychological laws maybe. But what is it that makes all this stuff hold together as part of a unified reality that keeps the movement of science going? So you think about physics in search of a grand unified theory of everything. Why should we even think there's such a thing? Why should we think that there's some ultimate level of resolution? Right? It is part, it's, it, it is a, you know, a consequence of believing in some kind of design. Right? And there's some sense in which that however multifarious and diverse the phenomena of nature are, they are ultimately unified by the minimal set of laws or principles possible. Insofar as science continues to operate with that assumption, there is a presupposition of design that is motivating the scientific process. Because it would be perfectly easy especially giving funding incentives and so forth, to stop the pursuit of science at much lower levels. You know, understand a certain range of phenomena in the way that's appropriate to deal with that phenomena and just stop there and not go any deeper or any farther. Okay? So, so in the, and, and this was the kind of thing that Huell was talking about that Darwin failed to explain. Because as Darwin explained how life diversified, you know, proliferated, and how there was all these extinctions and creations and so forth taking place in nature, uh, what, what kept on getting lost from the picture was, what was the point of it all? Is it just an endless cycle of creation and destruction? Is that all there is? You see? Um, and so there's a sense in which there is design at that ultimate level, the ultimate teleology, you might say, what provides the ultimate closure. You know, it keeps on motivating the knowledge enterprise so that you're never just satisfied with what you find out at a given point in time. Okay? Um, and it, it seems to be that ultimate level right, uh, is where the design hypothesis continues to have some bite, it seems to me, in terms of motivating science. Okay. Um, but that itself then raises problems. Okay. Um, about how much more time do I have? 25 minutes. Okay. Um, and my interest, see, my interest in the design hypothesis, you might say, is at this macro level. And I do think that if we don't have that kind of macro sense of an overall design, um, that in a sense, it'll be quite easy to reduce all the smaller levels of design to naturalistic processes. And, and it's going to be at the ultimate level of unity, intelligibility, of nature as such. Why does it all hang together? Why are all these different things, all these different ways of, of, of reality, why are they all part of one package? 
That's the level at which I think design ultimately works. Okay? And that's where you start to have to get a notion of the mind of God that rises above the particular ways, you know, even law-like ways in which divine agency may occur in the world. Okay? So it's at that level then that becomes an interesting question. Well, as it turns out, of course, the history of theology, if nothing else, is full of ingenuity. Um, and, um, what <laughs> and, and one of the fields that ca became very important, uh, especially in the 17th century, so that is to say, in the period of the scientific revolution, where you start to get scientists, you know, this is in the period of the Protestant Reformation, so you're getting, you know, people becoming increasingly emboldened to take their faith into their own hands, read the Bible for themselves in their native languages very often, and make decisions for themselves as to how to interpret what it says. And that's the context in which the scientific revolution occurred. Okay? Um, and it was in this context that people who were very much concerned about retaining a certain kind of unity to Christendom in the face of all of this fractioning that's taking place intellectually, right? Uh, this field came up called theodicy. And some of you who are theologians, you will know what this field is. Um, it's, I think, nowadays uh, a kind of a boutique subject in theology. But um, uh, to me, this is kind of where the action is with regard to the issue of design at the macro level. Um, because the, it, it's basically, uh, literally from the Greek, uh, it means explaining God's sense of justice, where the implication is, okay, God is the best possible God, creates the best possible world, but why do particular things look so awful? Right? How can the suboptimalities of the world, from death, destruction, imperfect, you know, arrangement of organisms, add up to the best possible world? Because that's the only world God could create if we believe this God that we believe in. So this then becomes an intellectual problem. And it's a problem that in a way is partly to be solved by science. Okay, I mean to a large extent by science actually. Um, because there's a sense in which things that may look very suboptimal, like you look at an organism just by itself and you say, boy, this organism looks like it's moving around awkwardly. But then if you put it in a larger context where it's in a particular environment, then it doesn't look so awkward. Right, and then you put it in a larger context, you see. The point is it is meant to in a way... Um, provide a kind of guidance for research where at the end of the day you're trying to explain why everything is the way it is, no matter how bad it is. Um, and these people who were very much the practitioners of theodicy and the, the person who coined the word in 1710 um, was Leibniz, the philosopher Leibniz, but by no means the only one. I mean, Leibniz in a way, um, you, you know, this kind of theodicy of Leibniz was very much the thing that was ridiculed by Voltaire and the novel Candide, the character Dr. Pangloss, who just, you know, Voltaire, you know, Candide in the novel is going through all these mishaps and, you know, he's trying to get an education, but everywhere he goes there's a disaster and Dr. Pangloss is, is, is like his mentor and he just says, look, there's an explanation for this, there's a reason for this, don't, don't fear, keep on believing, it, it makes sense in the end. You see, uh, this is the best of all possible worlds. Um, now, I put, I put this point to you because, see, Oh, very often nowadays, when you read people like Richard Dawkins and others who, who criticize uh, the design hypothesis, you know, often they, aim, they look at, look, if I were God, I would never have constructed an organism that way. You know, this is sort of the Jerry Coyne school of sophistication, right? <laughs> um, and he and, uh, and said, well, first of all, you don't believe in God. Second of all, you know, that doesn't put you in a great position to figure out what he would have done. Um, but the point is that, that, that this kind of way of, this concern, right, that in a sense, if this is the best possible world, why are there so many things that don't seem to go right, um, was very much present already in the 17th century. And in fact, this led to what, what became a very sophisticated discussion um, that fed into modern conceptions of engineering, political economy, and so forth, as to what is the appropriate system level within which we can talk about things functioning together as parts toward bringing about some sort of systemic functions. Okay? Theodicy was very instrumental in actually getting people to start thinking about things that way, and part of it was in response to the idea that something can be designed in the whole, in terms of a larger unity, yet not appear very designed in particular parts. But it's part of an overall picture, and that any alternative would have been worse. Okay? So you could have had an organism that was very efficient in one sense, but then lots of other things would have gone by the wayside. Okay? And this is what theodicy was about. Um, and the, th the thing about the Odyssey, in the, in the, in the uh, 18th century, this, um, um, this, this, uh, this branch of theology moved more uh, directly into natural theology, especially under Newton's influence, um, and, and became actually, in a way, quite domesticated. It became a very kind of 
high church thing to pursue. Um, and um, one of the people who's at the tail end of this development in the late 18th century, early 19th century, was already mentioned, and that was William Paley. Okay. Now, William Paley, as some of you may know, is uh, kind of the intellectual godfather of the intelligent design movement, you might say. He's kind of like, in a way, he, he works very well as a foil against Darwin because Darwin read, read his, his major works when he was a student. Um, and to a large extent, what Darwin explicitly rejected when he rejected design was Paley's version of it. Um, now, one of the things I think is very important when one reads Paley in the whole um, is that, uh, first of all, from the history of philosophy standpoint, Paley is normally seen as one of the founders of utilitarianism. Okay, I mean, this is a very important point because what happens with theodicy and natural theology over the course of the 18th century, and certainly by the 19th century, is become secularized. Okay? Now, utilitarianism, you know, is all about the greatest good for the greatest number, and it's all about making trade-offs where you're concerned about the overall consequences rather than just the locally wo local ones. Well, the idea is that Paley, along with people like Joseph Priestley, the radical Unitarian chemist, um, were all developers of utilitarianism before Bentham, before Jeremy Bentham, um, and for them, the, utilita the ultimate utilitarian was God. God was the divine calculator, right? God is making the trade-offs. Right, coming up with the optimal solution to nature. Right? And, and the background assumption here right, is matter is resistant, matter is, is in some sense fallen, God's got his work cut out. Okay? God can't just project ideas, God's got to deal with matter, and this is the problem. And so there's a kind of economy of nature that needs to take place. And that phrase, economy of nature, which uh, you know, one of the earlier contemporaries, you know about Linnaeus, he talks about the economy of nature, right? It's part of that idea. And a lot of our notions of ecology come from that. Why do certain species live in certain places and not other places and all this kind of stuff? Okay, well, the point is that Paley's a utilitarian. The, the whole, his natural theology is just, you know, shot through with utilitarian reasoning, okay? God's utilitarian reasoning, which we perceive as kind of functional arguments for why organisms are the way they are. Okay? God wants them to be this way, so they have these organs designed in this fashion. But one of the things that Paley also supports is not just, as it were, design at the level of the organisms, but he also supports a kind of overarching notion of design that includes, among other things, Thomas Malthus. Now, Thomas Malthus, who is in a way um, the kind of intellectual antecedent of natural selection theory basically says that there that, that in a sense population pressure is inevitable that there is always a shortage of resources vis-a-vis -vis the rate at which population grows and so there's a sense in which death and extinction is just a natural process it is and and, and this is in the context of people wanting to extend poor laws to say, well, look, you know, it's only because uh, we, we haven't given the poor people the poor enough that they're not able to survive. Malta says, no, that's not going to do any good. That's just part of, the, there's a divine agency there. Maybe not in a way that's completely transparent, because after all, just because we are capable of figuring out divine agency doesn't mean we're going to do it overnight, doesn't mean this is going to be simple, but the first thing we can do is to get a statistical grasp on the matter, which is what Malthus attempted to do. Okay, um, and so the point here for Paley was P Paley strongly endorses Malthus's view as a sophisticated way in which G God ends up turning the suboptimal into the optimal because the people who are left to survive, you know, in a sense, are better, are more fit, and they don't require handouts. I put it in contemporary language, but this is basically it. And, and, and Paley was very comfortable with that because, of course, there is this other Christian line of argument, you know, at the pastoral level, which say, you've got to be concerned for the poor, you've got to take care of them, you know, we should be taxing rich people more, and so forth. And Malthus's conclusion was, you know, you do that, it's a, it, you're never going to, it's a Sisyphean struggle, you're never going to win that battle. So don't waste resources. Let nature take, take its course because it has God's hand. Okay. So what at a, at, a, at a local level seems very bad and very ill-designed and very poor, in the long term, is supposed to be good. How long a term? Well, Malthus doesn't tell us. And of course, by the time you get to Darwin, right, Darwin says, is this, if this is your design theology, I'm not having it. And I think that's a very important point here, that when Darwin rejects Paley, right, he's reject, you know, it's not just that, you know, uh, 
he, he doesn't believe that, the, that organisms are intelligently designed or something. He doesn't believe this whole picture, which basically pursues intelligent design to the ultimate degree, even if it means taking on board that a good God could end up doing things that at least on the surface seem quite bad. Because that's where this argument leads you, you see. If you have this very rational theology where God's hand is everywhere in the world and everything happens for a reason, right, and you're trying to put it all together, right, then at the end you have to end up justifying a lot of very horrible things as somehow part of the divine hand. Okay? Um, and theodicy and natural theology for that reason were always very difficult to sell at the pastoral level. Because when people's relatives and loved ones die, you know, you don't want to say, well, you know, you're looking at too small a picture here. <laughs> you know, there's a bigger picture here, you know, and, and, and yes, there, you know, life didn't turn out as it should have been and so forth, but this was probably for the better because there's probably someone else being born somewhere else as a result using those resources who could do more with it. I mean, I think this is where Paley was coming from. He was coming from that. And, and, uh, and there's some interesting... Um, some historians of science have, uh, because Paley used to give a lot of lectures to workers, and you can imagine what he's like in that context, right? Where, where basically he said, stiff upper lip, guys. You know, I know you don't make a lot of money, but at least you're not given extra money that you can then waste on alcohol. You know, so take it a good side of this. It keeps you disciplined. You see, and so there was, there was a lot of this kind of thinking of rational, where there's design everywhere, right? Um, and now you might say, well, you don't have to take intelligent design that far. Well, I'm not so sure. You see, there's an issue here, right, in terms of, especially if you bring in the concept of God, right, in, in the Abrahamic sense, as the intelligent designer, and given the amount of power, knowledge, and responsibility that such a God is supposed to have, right, then it seems to me that intellectually you are forced down this route, right, and then you start to think, well, the issue is just to get all the other believers on board with this. Okay? Uh, and I think this is one reason why um, this kind of design argument has not, has, uh, in a way, peop the religious people, I'm talking about religious people, have been reluctant to embrace it. Because of the intellectual consequences, if you really try to mesh your theology and your science in a very close way. So all of these kinds of objections that I'm talking about here, and I've been, you know, raising, you might say, in the background to intelligent design, are not primarily objections that would come from scientific people. Okay? Uh, because in a sense, Darwin could, as it were, accept the facts that natural theologians were talking about, like Paley, but then say, in that case, no God. Right? No design. You know, there's no overarching design. Because if that's the only point at which God can be resolved, that's not a God worth believing in. Okay? So that was a trick, always, uh, within theology, um, and, and uh, with regard to accepting this kind of argument. So the more convenient thing to do has been a kind of theistic evolution thing, which is kind of like, um, you know, in the United States where we had a segregation of the races for a while, uh, until the 1960s effectively, right? We had this doctrine uh, of separate but equal science religion, right? Uh, only black, white in the original case. Um, and this is like the Dennis Alexanders of the world. The, the theistic evolutionists have a kind of separate but equal doctrine. So in a sense, God starts the ball rolling, but then everything else takes place as science. And in a sense, you, don't, you never really get, you never get God or divine agency or anything like that in the picture as part of the theoretical structure through which you understand how nature operates. You just, give, you, know, you just say it's the beginning, right? It's the creative moment. It's just a spark. And then you sort of let nature take its own course, and God, in a way, doesn't have to be responsible for anything. Okay? Um, and I think this is the most convenient option. I think this is one of the reasons why uh, theistic evolution has a, a, a kind of a broad kind of following you know, among people who still like to think of themselves as religious but don't want to think too hard about it. <laughs> That's my view, my, my, my real view. I, I, don't, I, don't think if, I don't think you could be a theistic evolutionist in the sense I've just described if you think very hard about the issue. Because if intelligent design refers to divine agency, then you, you really have to think about what that means, with, in, you know, what it means for God to be acting in the world, knowing the world as it is. Okay? Um, how much more time do I have? Ten minutes. Well, I'm thinking actually of stopping here because I want to get some discussion on this matter. It's up, it's up to you. This I want to get some because I think that, you know, given this kind of audience, I think this is a sort of thing uh, to be discussing with these people that, because I'm, I'm assuming I'm with a, a broadly theistic friendly audience, and I do think there is a point at which um, you know one has to think about 
um, what the theological implications are of taking on board the intelligent design hypothesis in a robust way where it becomes part of a general research program. So, let's see. Okay. Thank you very much. So thanks to Professor Fuller's generosity. We've got plenty of time for question discussion. Um, Professor Fuller told me beforehand that you welcome questions from all perspectives and uh, That's right. on the broader issues as well. That's as right. The if, there, if there's a Dawkins person <laughs> in here, I'm sorry I neglected you. <laughs> okay, you, sir. Okay. Uh, well, firstly, I'd like to say thank you for your, your brilliant talk. Um, secondly... Um, I won't repeat that part. Secondly, I'm trying to write about this, um, and um, s someone read something I wrote and they said, oh, you, you, you're a bit like Dawkins, so I've got to tone that down, but on the other <laughs> side. But the, the thing that I wanted to say was that um, what I don't understand is that I'm very into the soul, okay? yeah. and for me, one of the qualities of the soul is the faculty that we call intelligence. And actually, if we really think about intelligence, what is intelligence? What is its... What is its thinginess? What is the essence of intelligence? So anyway, we just like, say there's this thing we all take for granted, we call it intelligence. And this is what scientists like Dawkins use. They use this quality called intelligence to explore the world. And they explore it, and they try to make it intelligible. But what science seems to have come to is say we're using intelligence to make the world intelligible, and we, the high high priesthoods of this new cult will tell you that what we discovered is actually, it's not intelligent at all. Yeah, and no. that's the thing which I find so fascinating. Yes. If it's so unintelligent, yeah, yeah. how could it give rise to our intelligence? Okay, no, that's a very good point. I mean, uh, I'm, so the question has to do with, um, you got these atheist scientists like Dawkins, um, who in a sense are in the business of rendering the world intelligible through science, but they end up, following, they end up finding, it seems, that the world doesn't have any intelligence. Now, how do you square that? Right, that's the question. Um, I think this is a very good point. And if you look at, i uh, got Huell up here. Um, Huell was one of the guys who really stressed that science wouldn't be possible if the universe were not intelligible. But intelligibility isn't, as it were, a property that human beings project on the world. I mean, maybe Kant thought this, but this is not what Huell thought. Huell thought that, in a sense, I intelligibility, you have to, you, the, the, world, the world's intelligibility is something that actually enables science to succeed in the long term. Because it's one thing to say, okay, I can project some intelligence in the world, but can you get a long-term sustained project out of that, right? So the, in other words, is the world tractable to your intelligence in a deep way? Because it's one thing to say, I imagine the world to be one way and it turns out to be that way, but now, you know, I see it's acting a little funny and I'm going to hypothesize some strange, crazy physical processes that underlie what I see. And sure enough, they turn out to be there. Right? I mean, and so the fact that through the process of hypothesis testing and creation, where often we come up with very strange ideas, but nevertheless get tested and end up being, you know, bearing fruit, shows that the idea that the world is intelligible makes sense. So, you know, after all, a priori, who would have thought, you know, DNA would have a triple helix? Right? And, and this whole way of, you know, putting things together. I mean, that's very bizarre, right? Obviously, people had to come up with it initially, but there was no guarantee it was going to work. Right? And the fact that that process, that iterative process of inquiry, even when we're, 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 we're learning more and more counterintuitive things about nature, still yields fruits, right, is demonstration of the intelligibility of nature. Which means, at the very least, I would say, that nature is in some sense mind-like. Right, so in other words, nature has been designed in such a way that our minds, you know, it's tractable to our minds. And this is where I do think, um, where the Abrahamic religions have a certain advantage, because as long as you've got this idea we're creating the image and likeness of God, then you can start to explain that why that intelligibility thing should work. I mean, so, in, in, and, and, that, and that's why I do think there's a sense in which there's a theological debate to be had, because I don't think that all theologies can explain intelligibility as well. And, and, and look, the fact of the matter is, there's a, that, the idea that we are creating the image and likeness of God, and in some sense nature is mind-like, and mind-like means not only that God has a mind, but that we have a mind like God's, right, is a very specific theological assumption. It is not one shared by all the other religious cultures of the world. In fact, that's one reason why the other religious cultures in the world didn't pursue science with the kind of depth and dedication and doggedness. Because after all, there have been a lot of disasters in science. But nevertheless, we keep on pursuing, we keep on finding things. Yeah. I'd just like to comment, I mean, the, the, the yogis of India, ancient India, they said centuries ago, using 
higher sensory perception that um, the universe was billions of years old. Now, how did they know? They, they, they literally, they said it was billions of years old. So they, they were interested in the nature of reality, but because they were able to access reality, I mean, this is what I believe, obviously, many people know. <laughs> they were able to access reality in a super sensory or a higher sensory way. They didn't really need to do science the way we do, because they were not interested in matter in the way that we're interested well, in Well, okay, look, I... Did I, you repeat the comment? Yeah, yeah, okay. So an argument has been made here that, in fact, these the yogis of India had the super sensory perception that enabled them to understand the, the age of the universe as being billions of years before we did doing science. And so there's a sense in which they didn't need the science to come up with the same insights. This is your point. They weren't interested. They weren't interested. Well, the point here is, right, science is not just, as it were, about having a lucky guess about the age of the universe. Right? Science is a very systematic project that operates at many levels, because it's not enough just to know the age of the universe. You also have to know the means by which it came about. You have to know various mechanisms operating in nature. You have to know to what degree they operate and what circumstances. If you think about the level of systematicity and detail that science provides, and it's not just, as it were, an intellectual amusement. This is actually stuff that actually has some practical consequences for the way people live our lives and the way we've reconstituted the Earth. You know, so, so the point is, you know, don't, don't underestimate what the significance of this science is, even though these yogis came up with the right answer on the age of the uh, universe. I think it's fabulous. I, I'm just saying there's more than one way to know reality. But, okay. I, I love modern science, by the way. Look, no, but again, okay, I, 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 I don't want to be too heavy-headed about this. Um, um, I do think if what we're talking about, part of the issue here that we're talking about, and I think what makes this a kind of interesting conference is, um, and I think this is where intelligent design is a very controversial issue, is about the relationship between theology and science, right? And, and the kind of science, as it were, that theology wants to, that, that one would have theology relate to, is our science, right? So the kind of science that Steve Meyer is defending is frontline contemporary science. And there's hovering in the background, he doesn't say it explicitly, but I'll say it explicitly, is that there's some notion of divine agency, right? And it's not any old notion of divine agency, Right? It, is a very, it has a very particular theological provenance. And if you didn't have that theological provenance, going back to you know, our being created in the image and likeness of God, you would have never got to where we are now in our science. This doesn't deny there aren't other ways of looking at the world. But if what we're talking about is providing a theological backdrop for our science, I don't think you could have got to it through the yogis. And probably, you know, your, your point would be you wouldn't want to. And I agree. Okay, okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to... Yeah. Steve, you, you mentioned uh, oh, you Dennis Alexander as yeah. an example. Of one of oh, that's right. He's here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, no, but he's in... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My question is, um, why, why do you think it is that theistic evolutionists haven't been able to embrace the intelligent design argument? Is it because they don't want to be seen as idiots by the, the scientific establishment? I think that's only part, I mean, okay, why don't theistic evolution people want uh, to embrace the intelligent design argument? Now, you know that book that Alexander wrote against intelligent design a couple of years ago? I think the reason for that, I mean, part of it is what you're saying right now, namely that uh, he doesn't want to be seen as an idiot by the atheists. Um, uh, but uh, I think there's another issue, and that also comes out in this book, is um, I do think that Alexander is very uncomfortable with the conception of God that intelligent design seems to imply. I mean, and this is one of the things that struck me when I read the book, because I was kind of looking for his theological, you know, compass point, you might say, on this. And so he immediately, his way of kind of stereotyping intelligent design's God was the deistic God. God is big engineer, lays out the plans, you know, and then kind of steps back and not do, does much. And, 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 and the problem with that conception of God, right, again, is at the pastoral level. What kind of a God is this? Kind of cold lays things out, just lets things take its course, figures it's good, I did it, so no problem, they're going to have to live with it, right? That kind of conception of God, right, is a very cold conception of God that's not very well suited for pastoral concern, you know, for, for believers. And, 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 and Alexander, as you probably know, does have that kind of function, he does some pastoral work. And so I do think, in a sense, he is tuned into what I'm talking about here uh, in that respect, right? That there's a sense in which if you really get serious about what divine agency is and, and all the rest of it, um, in the intelligent design concept, then you might have some real difficulties within a, within a conception of God that you can actually feel comfortable with, even if it's true. You see? Uh, and I think that's kind of the issue there. I think that's the, and I think that's why a lot of religious believers stand off. Yes, sir? Uh, Steve, are you saying then that the ID, ID movement as it is now 
is denying, it doesn't want to put a name on the designer because they want to avoid bureaucracy. Is that what you're saying? Well, uh, the, the, okay, so the question is, um, is the ID movement uh, not talking about the nature of the designer because they want to avoid theodicy? Um, well, actually, they don't all do that. William Dembski, right, who is you know, both mathematician and theologian, right, that book, uh, you know, uh, what's called, The End of Christianity, yeah. right. Um, now, that book bites the bullet, right? That book actually does what I think eventually you have to do, which is to say, if you're going to have this tight integration of science and theology, you have to square it with the theology, and you have to think about what kind of a conception of God, what does the fall mean, all these kinds of stu things have to be addressed, and, you know, within a scientifically respectable framework. Um, you know, obviously, you know, I personally don't agree with all the details or anything, but that does have to be done if the full force of ID is to come across. Because I think at the end of the day, you know, um, you know th that is what, as an overall research program... Well, you might complete picture of reality. Yes, exactly. And, and, I think, and I think in a sense, you know, see, I think the only problem, my, my view is the only problem with Dembski is there only, there's only one of them, right? I mean, you know, in a sense, you don't just want one kind of version of this on the table because then it can look kind of parochial and so forth. But I do think that, generally speaking, people who are sympathetic to the intelligent design movement should not just be, I mean, it's important that they be doing the detailed laboratory work. That's important to do, Biologic Institute, Doug Axe, all those people. That's good, but you also need people operating at the macro level, giving the impression of what intelligent design looks like as a research program that could be a serious competitor with neo-Darwinism, which is also this other kind of completely comprehensive research program. You see? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it seemed reasonable to me just to say that, you know, we're looking for patterns, and that's it, because it's scientific nature. We you know the patterns don't lead us to say something about the designer, so we're okay not to say anything. And to me, that's legitimate. But then you do have this other problem of, like you brought out today, old theodicy. And it seems like there's these two things. Well, yes, I, I, I do agree. I mean, if, if intelligent design just stays at the level of pattern recognition, okay, which, you know, actually, you know, if, you, if you look at the, the main blog site for intelligent design, Uncommon Descent, right, there for a long time, maybe even still now, there is this definition of intelligent design that makes it look like it's just about pattern recognition. You know, design detection. You know, and it seems to me, my God, that, you know, that's not a science. That's like the first step of a science. That's the data gathering part of the science. That's not science. Science is about theories, hypotheses, right, uh, you know, explanations, things of that kind. And I do think it's important that, you know, the idea of intelligence get put on the table and there be a clear definition of it. So I, you know, I, the intelligent design movement d does deserve credit for that, I think, going beyond Shannon and all this. That's very important. But then there's the nature of the agent that in some way is instantiating this intelligence. And, and that, it's at that point, when you get to the explanatory structure, then you got a real fight. Steve Mott. Yeah. Uh, Steve, this is just terrific. We, uh, just back on the audience, Steve and I were at a conference together about a week ago. He raised a lot of these issues. And, we, and it was in the last 10 minutes of the, the event, so we didn't really get to, to uh, thrash this out. But I, I think so now it's going to happen. No. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the frustrating thing was the lack of time last week to tell you how much I agree with what you're saying. And the, 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 the tension that sometimes arises is that you have within the intelligent design research uh, community scientists who are both theologically committed and those who are not, people that are committed to a very minimalist conception of a designer, those who have a very specific conception that may, for example, flow out of a, a, a Judeo-Christian uh, uh, tradition, or even a specifically biblical tradition, this is a Tyndall event where people are concerned about that. And uh, so I, I've been thinking about this for a week, and uh, the, one, of the, one of the things just that struck me in your, your conversation was, or your, your talk was about uh, the, the way in which with Paley, uh, the, the, a very, and with, with, with Leibniz, you've got a very, uh, the, the best of all possible worlds type theodicy was developed. I work, was working early on on a research project one summer with Dembski and Nelson. We were in the, the hex of the Tyndall House where we were doing the work, and we were reading the last chapter of Paley's book. Uh -huh. And it sounds like it was written by a 19th century English academic whose experience of the world was largely confined to the back garden of Cambridge colleges. That was his picture of There's the best of possible yeah, possible. Everything was <laughs> <laughs> I bet you didn't realize that. <laughs> and, and, and what was very, you know, with, with, with Dembski and Nelson, these guys both orthodox biblical Christians as am I, 
And it was very obvious, in, in a sense, what struck us was that, that Paley did not have, uh, he, he may have believed in it personally, but it, it played no role in his, the, the concept of the fall played no role yeah. in his theodicy. And so you got that strain that led, just as you described, directly to Darwin's rejection. I, I, I can't remember the historian of science who said that Darwin you know, longed for a better, he, he belonged to a class of God deniers who longed for a better God than God. Exactly. And, and I think that the impoverished notion of, uh, the impoverished notion of the fall that was implicit in the natural theology that developed Paley and beyond led directly to that kind of intellectual problem that you, yes. you beautifully described. What I want to suggest is that it is, as you I think this should be part of the ID movement, and it is at least in principle possible that empirical data uh, addressed by ID scientists could adjudicate these different models of theology. Well, that would be interesting. And as the program develops, I mean, we're in some ways yeah, in a very yeah, incipient yeah. stage mm -hmm. because we've been so dominated for 150 years by methodological naturalism. And just getting the kind of case that I made on the table is such a big fight. Yeah. But that, that I do see this going forward in the directions that you're talking about. Where you know, in the conference where you and I were, we had uh, a German paleontologist who is not of the Abrahamic tradition. I think he uh, holds to some sort of process mm -hmm. theology. So he reacted very strongly to you saying that I ought to be willing to be theologically yeah. maximalist. <laughs> but I think it ought to be a you know a thousand flowers blooming here that the scientists who see the case for ID and then have different theological models, different models of theodicy, ought to be able to then begin to discuss those, pursue research. I, I, I raised the idea, or the example of Scott Minnick, the microbiologist who works on virulence, who is an Orthodox Christian who believes in the fall, and believes he's seeing evidence at the molecular level of the effect of nature that is now, in, in a sense, the, a, a, a biblical model would be one in which you would acknowledge both the original, the aboriginal design, but also subsequent decay. And he thinks you can see evidence of both of those things at the molecular uh -huh. level. So that's all by way of okay. affirming the basic point you're making. Let, let, let me Maybe summarize. Yeah, yeah, summarize. Well, um, <laughs> Steve, I'm loud enough that you probably don't need to. Well, but, but, <laughs> okay, well, Steve, Steve Meyer uh, basically um, said that uh, this is a direction that the sort of thing I was talking about with regard to getting into the larger theologically maximalist issues of theodicy is something that the ID movement um, is moving into and will move into more in the future. Or at least some members of it who have those theological issues. I'll overcommit you. But, uh, <laughs> the, um, but, but the, and, and, may, and raise a very interesting point, I don't want this point to disappear, uh, that namely that one might be able to adjudicate between alternative models of theodicy with empirical evidence. Now that is very interesting. And, and boy, oh boy, is that going to send some people to the hills. But, uh, not you hills, but. <laughs> but. No, no, but I think that is a, a I, I, I agree with Steve Meyer in that line of thinking that ID move in that kind of direction. That in a sense we revive theodicy as a kind of, a, you know, empirically grounded discipline in a sense. Yes, I, I so thank you. Okay, there was a question uh, uh, there, sir. Yes. When you were distancing intelligent design from a kind of Adam Sedgwick catastrophism view at the beginning, you, you didn't want booms in science. You, you didn't want miracles happening. I think that's what you were saying. And so, to my mind, theistic evolution would fulfill what you want. You know, some kind of implementation of design without um, a miracle happening. Um, but then at the end you were saying theistic evolution is not the way ahead. So how does God actually implement the design in your view? How, how does that come about without a miracle? No, in, in a sense, um, l let me, oh, sorry. Okay, so um, the issue is um, how do you get intelligent design without a miracle? Um, and especially given that I was uh, initially appearing to criticize the catastrophist view. Um, yeah, l let me just say that in a sense what I was doing there um, let me re recap, you might say, the rhetoric of the argument, right? Because we had a pre when, when Steve Meyer did his presentation, um, uniformitarianism was presented as providing a kind of basis for making an intelligent design argument, right? On the, on the, basically the similarity of there being intelligence behind the kinds of complexity that we see in the world. Normally when we see such complexity, we think that there's intelligence behind it. Okay, my point there was that the people who would have, that, that that kind of a view was precisely the view that got, you know, might say naturalized, right? In the sense that you, did, that, that God, you didn't need to have a God, you could just reduce it to whatever the natural forces were. So whatever divine agency you might think were, was operating could just in the end be explained through nature. And it was the catastrophists who actually retained a strong conception of God. 
okay, as coming in from the outside, as something literally supernatural, right, and, and, and in a sense showing that uniform, uniformitarianism could not adequately explain all the important break events that took place in, in the in history of nature. Um, my own view about this, to be honest with you, is a bit on the fence, my own personal view. I'm just saying that, 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 that uh, in the past, when people followed the kind of argument that Steve was presenting, it didn't necessarily lead to intelligent design direction, right? The intelligent, and, and this is why I was arguing that the intelligent design argument, you might say, in its strongest and most potent and maybe even scariest form is at the maximal level, where in a sense you say there are all these things happening in nature, some of which seem well designed, some of them don't, but at the end there's this overall design in terms of which it all makes sense, right? And, and I'm saying that at the end, it's pitching the argument at that level that is the strongest but also scariest level at which intelligent design should be pitched and that's where the problem of theodicy becomes very important because then you do have to justify evil in a way you don't if you're just looking at design at a much more restricted levels. Can I Professor? Uh, one, one way to treat this maybe is to say there are different uh, levels of language. One kind of description which can be very precise and mathematical and others which are more qualitative, but, but which we can still work with. And in fact, we already have these qualitative descriptions in biology. So uh, that might be a direction in, in which we could go. You mean in terms of talking about the diff So you're talking about levels of uh, description for intelligent design, that some would be more qualitative and some would be more quantitative? Uh, yes. Well, perhaps I can say a bit more about um, the direction we're pursuing. I'm, uh, Just briefly, please. Yeah, okay. One way of... Uh, getting into it is by the observer in quantum mechanics. And uh -huh. uh, you, this sort of leads you in new directions, and that's the direction in, in which some people have gone. So, um, but, but, but also you can, the um, uh, thing that I've written about is that there are limits to description, that the uh, universe is in fact, sure. um, uh, can't, can't be um, accommodated within explicit descriptions. So. Uh, uh, I think some, somewhere there there's a, a way of uh, saying we, we can talk about God, but not in the... Um, the kind of negative theology, essentially. God, right, God is what we cannot describe. Uh, well, well, that is necessary for the system, but cannot be explicitly... We, we, we cannot be too specific about God, but we can uh, maybe be able to make some general statements. Okay, no, actually that's a very familiar move in theology. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, the point I would make, though, about... about you know, the naturalization of theodicy that goes to the, the question of quantification is um, economics. If you look at the language of economics, which is all brought in from theodicy as political economy in the late 18th, 19th century, and the way all that gets mathematized, um, you can already find qualitative precedents for most of that stuff in Leibniz's theodicy, for the way cost, benefit, all the way, way these notions are talked about quant quant qualitatively in Leibniz, end up getting cashed out mathematically. Now again, you might say, my God, God is a kind of cost accounting person. I mean, um, but in a sense, that's kind of what these people were driving toward, right? I mean, that was kind of what they were driving toward. So there was, there was a quantification of this kind of thinking over time. It just left theology, right? And it moved into this other discipline that we now call economics. It's as the mathematicians of uh, dealt with infinity and they uh, find that the, uh, that the rules get changed. Yeah, no, no. Yes, uh, I mean, of course, the current science, well, the contemporary scientists, a few which has become very apparent in the last 10, uh, 15 or 20 years, is, of course, is that it combines both the uniformitarian and the catastrophic view. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That actually these things have gone on mm -hmm. forever, but you know, the fascinating thing about the history of life is precisely these catastrophes and the mass extinctions and the subsequent emergencies and so on. And, when, and so I always think that you know, one of the great problems about the intelligence design argument is how can you make any sort of logical, literal explanation for that phenomenon? I mean, why should, other than in the, sort of the big picture? But people, you know, intelligent design is a sort of literal argument, isn't it? And they want to know, well, what is your answer yes. to this question? You know, why should? Yes. You know. No, no, but, but no. I mean, I just want before you start. I want to say I think you you actually do have the spirit of this right. I mean, one of the things that is very striking about intelligent design is the literalness with which with which it wants to use intelligence to explain things, including a wide variety of things, 
that, uh, as you say, may on the surface not look like they can be very well explained at all at a general level. I just want to make a short point of clarification about the uh, way in which I'm using the uniformitarian principle, because uniformitarianism can be defined in different ways. And in the 19th century, what happened was that it became conflated with specific explanations of a materialistic sort. So uniformitarianism, which at base is a simple methodological principle that we should be invoking causes which are known from our experience to be able to explain the effects in question, became associated with specific uniformitarian explanations of the kind that Lyell offered in ge geology, which were gradualistic sure. and materialistic. And so by the end of the century, it's closely associated with methodological naturalism. Exactly. And the, the mischievous move I've made is to try to disentangle yeah, I noticed that, yes. And, and, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and that's why, that's that's why, why, that's why I undid it. Yeah. Yeah, the, the fundamental methodological <laughs> principle of, of sufficient causation, but not stipulate what types of causes must be uh, proposed but no, but you see, you can use uniformitarianism if you're willing to then make the further claim that, um, well, okay, uh, when, when you have artifacts of a certain level of complexity, um, intelligent agents have done it, and the intelligent agents that we know of who have done such things are humans, and nature is of a similar degree of complexity and specificity, and so that agent is an intelligent agent, clearly not like us, but a, an intelligent agent maybe much bigger version than us or something like this. In, in other words, you make an extrapolation to God from human intelligence. You know, uh, th in other words, the idea that God differs from us by degree and not kind, at least with regard to intelligence. Now see, that's a theological move that's recognizable, um, and, uh, and, and it is one that uh, you know, I think the people in the scientific revolution did, for example, and it's one of the things that led to modern science being what it is. But it's a very controversial move theologically, as you can imagine, right? Because uh, um, I mean, the, the more standard kind of orthodox theological move is to say that yes, God's intelligent and we're intelligent, um, but, the me but the relationship between these two kinds of intelligence is, uh, is merely analogical. Right, analogical in the weak sense, that there's a sense in which, uh, you know, we can't quite, un you know, there's no way you can draw a line of how you can become more godlike in any kind of straightforward way because the predicates are being used somewhat differently. Right? But in this sense, it seems to me intelligent design does kind of require, if we're going to take this intelligence argument further into the question of divine agency, that there be univocal predication. In other words, intelligence in God and intelligence in us is using intelligence in the same way, but there's a difference of degree. Yeah. Thank you very much. <coughs> I wonder if you could comment on the relative strengths and weaknesses of different systems for theodicy. <laughs> uh, All of them? Then? Yeah. <laughs> a five. Um, a five? <laughs> Christian uh, deism, you know, the wider. Uh, Christian theism without a cosmic fall. Um, Christian theism with some sort of interruption type fall curse uh, coming in. Um, Islam, where you have a sovereign um, uh, God, but no um, fall, I suppose that might fall in the Christian theism uh, without a cosmic fall, and then a morally ambiguous de um, uh, God who, um, so therefore you can, you could have a, say, a malevolent designer, but yeah. it doesn't have to be. Okay, human. so the question is, uh, what version of theism, uh, what version of theodicy do I endorse? Um, uh, the co relative strengths and weaknesses. Well, look, I'm not going to get, I mean, obviously this is not the place for me to go into that, but I will say a general point about, uh, r relating to the five. Um, I do think um, two, th two things need to be kept, right, you might say, in a theodicy. Um, um, you need to keep, um, I do think you're going to, you can't get away from some idea of a fall. What's the fall? What is the fall? The f a fall? What's the, I don't know. the fall. Original sin? The fall of man? Adam? That kind of thing? Was, what, e e the eating the, the apple? Something like that, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the fall. No, the, no, I think that... I mean, because there, there's going to be an issue of... Something has gone wrong in nature. <laughs> right, exactly. You need some version of the fall, because obviously you're not going to say every little thing that happens in the world is the best possible thing that could have happened by itself. So you do need some notion of, of, of error, fall, fallibility, something of that kind in nature. That is for sure. I also think, to make your theodicy interesting, you're going to need some idea that, it is, that, the, that this is, in some sense, the best possible world. So that it is good, that God means good, all, you know, in the end. I think you need those two things. The rest of it, we can negotiate. But I think if you don't have those two things, then theodicy is not very, really very interesting. Yeah. Just going back to the uh, image of God thing, I think it's really important that we think, therefore, about uh, the ontology of God, who, who God is, and, and the Christian uh, tradition of God is uh, a holy trinity. 
I think this is very important because I think we've seen patterns and symmetries in creation which do seem to uh, point in that direction, but there can be um, uh, there can be an analogy made there between um, our intelligence and our self-consciousness and, and, and the way God is God is super personal. So we're persons, but God is super personal in that there are three persons in God. Do you have any comments on that? Well, um what, on the Trinity, on the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, the first, the, 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 I'll make a, let me make a serious point about the... Do- I, I'll respond to it this way, okay? Um, because I do think when one takes seriously the idea that you know, we're creating the image and likeness of God and our consciousness is like divine consciousness in some way and we can see similarities already, um, I do think this does... This is one of the sources of heresy historically in Christianity. And of course, one thinks of something like the Arian heresy, um, which was very much popular, you might, you might say, among the people in the scientific revolution, like Newton in particular, right? Um, where there's a sense in which um, he believes, you know, he's got direct access to God, that he doesn't need the mediation of Jesus Christ or anything like that. We're all kind of... So we, that, that when one talks about being created in the image and likeness of God, one means this in a very direct kind of way, right? That one, as it were, through one's own effort, through one's study, one's science, whatever, can access the mind of God. And I think that, that was a very common way of, of interpreting that relationship, the image and likeness of God, among the people in the scientific revolution. And that's why these guys typically did not write about their theology very openly, because they would be very easily accused of Harry, Ar- Arianism. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, By sir. the way, I hope, I hope people know what Ar- I mean, given the question about the fall, I'm not sure whether people would know what Arianism is. Um, but I just want to, I don't mean the Hitler doctrine, okay? Uh, I mean this Arianism. Arius. Sorry, I didn't mean to... <laughs> No, do you want to give a one-sentence definition of Arianism? For? Well, it's a denial of the Trinity. It's, it, it, it's the idea that, in a sense, we can become God, that there's a direct relationship to God, right? Uh, and, and it tends to be a very anti-clerical movement, right? Anti-mediation, that kind of thing. Very, very important move. Uh, Bishop Rowan Williams wrote a book about this. He wrote one of the main books on this topic. One other um, elephant in the room, at least for folk in, in Britain, I don't know how much he uh, appears on... Uh, TV screens in, in, in the US is uh, David Attenborough. Oh, yeah. He's, he's kind of the great That's popularizer right. of the, uh, the living dead. Uh, of, uh, the I mean, night of the living dead of yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, it would be nice if he would retire, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble is, he keeps believing all the politicians say now that we have to work until we drop. Uh, and he's a, he's a living embodiment of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do remember there was a, a challenge just three or four years ago. Uh, I think there was a push to try and get on the BBC particularly some, uh, some element of intelligent design injected into the debate uh, and possibly if you like a, a, a sort of biblical creation solution. Um, and I remember his immediate reaction to whoever he was in dialogue with was, uh, how can you believe in a God who creates the worm, which in West Africa, on all the great rivers, causes these terrible river blindness disease. So there is, there is an element of a kind of Darwinian reaction against the completely imperfectly uh, explained um, Christian theodicy. Yes, that's nobody's right. Ever, nobody's ever sat down with David Attenborough and say, uh, just because I believe in a God who has created and designed the world, I do not believe that every single natural event that happens is directly the result of God's intervention. That's a very good... That's so a, that sickness... Yeah, repeat the uh, as well. Okay, sickness thank you. and illness oh, uh, and uh, parasitism yes. uh, and okay. deformity... We've got to move on because... Um, sure. We've got to move on. Okay. Well, that's only my it, comment. I'm not, not asking you to see through because I think... No, but I, no, but I think it's a, wor- it's a point worth uh, reiterating. Um, so we need, we need people who can do theodicy in public in the TV studios yes. with people like Attenborough and Dawkins because that would pull the, the rug from under their feet yes. for about 95% of the things they say. Yes. My the other comment is... Can, can, I respo- can, can he have a second chance once I respond to this? Otherwise, I'm going to forget everything. Yes. Um, so, so the comment is that uh, given you've got people like Richard Attenborough who goes around saying, well, you know, if there was design... David, David. David sorry, David, Richard, whatever. I mean, uh, <laughs> but... Uh, but the point is uh, that, that they go around and they say that, uh, you know, if uh, there was an intelligent designer, why do we have all these problems in Africa and diseases and parasitism and worms and all the rest of it? And so it becomes important then that there be someone who can actually speak publicly about Christian theodicy and to be able to explain that to say that there's design in the, in the whole doesn't mean there has to be design. You know, everything has to be perfect in, in the individual parts. One point I want to make in response to that 
is then you still, nevertheless, that is a good response from the standpoint of uh, the person who's defending theodicy, but then you have to say, okay, well then what is the point of having this parasitism in Africa? Okay, it's not a good in itself, but it has to be in some sense a means toward some good end. Now somebody like Leibniz, okay, had his standard answer to this question, and it was basically that all the bad things that happened, all the disasters, all the diseases, were uh, spurs to our intelligence, right? They were kind of incentives for us to kind of train up, you know, to kind of learn more about nature, to learn more about where we are in the world and to, and to end up doing better and to, you know, to surpass ourselves so that we don't become complacent, uh, you know, and so he, that's how he interpreted all those negative things. And, and some people bought that. I mean, I think some people, I, I think uh, actually uh, in the history of science, some people took that very seriously. Other people thought it was completely bonkers. Okay, that, that in some sense, all the catastrophes of the world are meant as learning experiences for the people who remain alive which is kind of what Leibniz was saying. Okay, but you had another point. I didn't want to yep. derail you. Please. Well, yeah, no, my, my, uh, my, my question was, um, we've talked a lot about uh, biological systems, we've talked about uh, chemical processes. Uh, what we haven't really touched on uh, today is the whole issue of earth sciences. Mm -hmm. Because really the, the, the sort of center of the debate in the 19th century between Lyle and quote unquote the Orthodox Christians was the whole issue of um, catastrophism and uh, divine intervention in terms of shaking the, <coughs> the physical earth in which we, we, we now live. And, and, and I guess so my question is, do you see any mileage for somebody doing for earth sciences what Steve Meyer is doing for chemistry and the biology of the yes. cell? Yes. Uh, and really that bringing, question, bringing intelligent design uh, and if you like uh, a, a biblical creation framework back into Okay, thank you. Can you the okay, so the idea is, uh, would there be value, uh, and I can already tell you in advance, the answer is yes, in having a kind of Steve Meyer treatment of the earth sciences from an intelligent design standpoint. Now, I should say, historically, of course, in the, in the modern era, right, the earth sciences was where a lot of the creationism stuff came from initially, right, and the modern creationist movement came from that. And so I guess what you're arguing for is a kind of more updated, more sophisticated, one that engages with the science in a, in, in a, in a more detailed uh, way. I think that's exactly right. That is what is needed. Um, I think it'd be very bold, actually, too, because I think, in a sense, that's getting right to the heartland, you might say, of, of, what, of, of where the debate matters. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one last question in the corner. Can you make it brief, please? Yes, you, sir. Uh, well, I'll, I'll do my best. I'll come where are you? Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> I'm intrigued by uh, your uh, drawing a connection between uh, this global design idea and uh, the image of God. Uh, and, and also because in the timeline in biblical studies, which is where I live, uh, the, the ways in which uh, biblical students have talked about the image of God, that those have changed over time. And so the idea of a likeness between us and God that is uh, a likeness of our minds to God's mind is no longer um, popular, uh, and and is uh, holding it, holding a view something like that myself. I'm quite out of the mainstream. Um, so so I, I begin to wonder, uh, and, and actually the uh, the departure from that view, which which is the historic view, the departure from that comes somewhere in the 19th century. So I begin to wonder, and would like you to comment on whether there's a connection, uh, uh, you know, in, in the intellectual environment. Be between these, uh, be between this rejection of, the, or this reaction about global design on Darwin's part and so forth, uh, and uh, the way in which uh, biblical scholars and theologians have thought about the image of God. So, so can you repeat this last Yes, uh, this, I'm, I'm going to make sure I understand. I'm, I'm going to ask him a question that will repeat the question. How about that? Um, I want to make sure I understand what, you, what you're saying. You're saying that basically the kind of the conception of the, uh, of, of the image of God that, that I've been putting forward uh, in relation to global design is one that, in fact, in biblical studies went out of fashion in the, in the late 19th century. And, and you, but you also, but you hold this view I hold and you're an outlier. And, and, and so do I have an explanation for this? Yeah. Um, I do think, I see this as part of a general, um, again, I'm going to be, I'm going to be very broad brush about this and some theologians may not like it, but I think there has been a sort of derationalization of theology that's taken place after the 19th century, you know, where God gets in a way, uh, maybe to protect, uh, the, uh, protect faith, perhaps that God becomes more mysterious, right? And so our connection with God doesn't become as direct as a lot of the natural theology was suggesting with such a direct connection, 
you know, with the image and likeness of God. So I think there is a kind of, you know, and, I, and again, I don't want to use the word in too derogatory fashion, but I think there's an increasing mystification of the relationship between humans and God that takes place within Christian theology. You know, Karl Barth, people like this, that, you know, especially in the 20th century. And I think a lot of this stuff gets a lot of mileage because of all the disasters that take place starting in the late 19th and moving into the 20th century. So World War I, I think, is a very important moment in terms, of, uh, in terms of really turning away a lot of religious people from thinking that science is the realization of theology, right? given that World War I was the first science-based war. And I think as all those catastrophes developed over the course of the 20th century with science so clearly involved in it, that I think that really put the damper in any of this kind of strong image and likeness of God stuff that I've been talking about. Let's thank Professor Fuller not only for his talk, but for the question. Thank you.